If every picture tells a story, that can certainly be done by a group of performers at the Isabella Stewart Gardner Museum. That happened recently when four storytellers and poets performed a program about women's journeys and interconnected stories. They included our guest, an artist in residence at the museum, Christina Lofe. Thank you very much for being with us, Christina. Thank you so much. It's good to be in, in Boston again. Talk about what it means to be a, a storyteller and, and the way you grew into it in South Africa. Storytelling is something I definitely didn't see coming that I would become a full-time storyteller and that would be my profession. I started as a writer, I did poetry, short stories, and then I did what we call praise poetry. That's something that used to be done by men and mostly praise um, as the king walked in or when it was like social commentary but used in such beautiful language that sometimes you didn't know if it was praising or criticizing. So you had to be very sharp and aware of what's going on. And then I moved into the theatre world. After eight years in, in the theatre space, I found myself drifting towards storytelling. Now I perform in so many different spaces, in the most beautiful um, auditoriums, in opera houses, I've told stories. I perform under a tree, I perform in the classroom, I perform in university halls. And so storytelling has meant a lot of flexibility for me. It has meant a lot of access to my audiences. You interact with the audience much more than you would as a theater person because the lights are so bright, number one. You can hardly see anybody. And even if you get a standing ovation and deafening applause, you still haven't seen the people that are in the audience. But storytelling allows you to do that, to interact with the audience. The, the energy goes out and comes back and the circle continues. Well, in the news business, we're supposed to tell stories. We usually go in chronological order, cause and effect. Uh, but uh, when you did something like uh, Sometimes When It Rains, yeah. uh, that's different. Uh, explain that difference. <laughs> Sometimes When It Rains must be one of my most translated poems. It has been translated into Portuguese, into Japanese, into German, into Italian, into, into German. It's, it's fascinating how this poem has had such a life. For me, it is that remembering. It is only sometimes when it rains, I think of this and this that happened. Sometimes when it rains, I think of when it rained for hours and we didn't have to fetch water from the river for a day or two. Or sometimes when it rains with lightning and thunder. So all the things I remember when it rains, it keeps going to the refrain. And so that, that's a different uh, poem indeed. You use the word uh, memory a lot in, in okay. that explanation. Why is that so important? Memory is um, a very important um, part uh, of, of my life and my journey because um, first of all as a storyteller you need to have a good memory you need to remember the facts and yes in chronological order of what happened when and who was this and um, what were they doing and wh what is the type of place they were in what was the dilemma how did it get solved all of those things but also memory is important in the sense that we need to connect with where we come from a, a, my place of origin, where my people came from. And my father was big on that, on sharing history telling. And I appreciated that. I, I'm the youngest member of my family and I'm the one who remembers more than my older sisters and brothers. I just get, I guess I was tuned in in a different way. Speaking of where you come from, I mean, other than South Africa, of course, uh, your parents, the two different population groups mm -hmm. in South Africa, uh, sounds to me like you had to do some bridge building or learn how to do that. <laughs> I did not um, have a sense of it when I was very, very young. I stayed um, on my father's side of the family and the grandmother who told me stories. By the way, she was a master storyteller. Children in the neighborhood would beg their parents to let them come to my home to listen to my grandmother telling stories. I was very, very proud indeed. And then I must have been 10 years old when my mother suddenly rocked up and she took me and, went and took me to the Eastern Cape where she came from because I was born out of wedlock. And so she arrived and I didn't know who she was and because my father's wife was mama to everybody. And so when I went to live in the Eastern Cape, I came face to face with extreme poverty. I came face to face with these high mountains and, and uh, colder winters and all of those things. Durban is very mild winters and it's by the ocean and it's uh, very different. And my father's side of the family was slightly okay economically and all of that. But now you go to the Eastern Cape, I had to learn so many things. And um, only when I was much older did I appreciate it all the, the hard work and learning to do things with my own hands and understanding unless you do that and do that, you're not gonna survive. And, and also walking for an hour to school and walking back every single day. 
uh, hardship, but anything else going on in those walks other than just the effort? We had to walk very fast. We had to run because you can't be late and all of those things. And also, sometimes the inspectors that came to, to they would have to do surprise visits to the schools to see everything is going all right. And under apartheid, the education department was controlled by the apartheid government. And so this white person would arrive at the school who did not speak our languages. <laughs> they come and they want to know how we are doing and all of those things. First of all, we're scared of the white person. Number two, you kind of freeze no matter how well you are doing academically, but you have to try and, 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 and do your best. And so all of those things were very different, even though we didn't know um, in the beginning what this apartheid really, really meant. Our parents tried to shield us. The older you got, you got the picture. The older you got, you got the picture. That's why the, 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 the young people who marched in 1976 during the student, students' uprisings were, were, were so fierce. They had been with apartheid face to face. We in the villages, the, the police and the, 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 the inspectors and what they came from time to time. In the townships, in the cities, it was different. This is BNN News and we're talking with storyteller and poet Nsina Mlofe. Uh, Nsina, you, you talked about apartheid, living with that. Uh, did, did sort of responding to that, coping with it, did that mm. shape your work in some way? Absolutely. Living under apartheid shaped our work. Uh, whether you wrote music, whether you wrote um, um, stories or theater pieces and all of that. You know, there is a song that, um, that was banned under apartheid. <laughs> a lot of music was banned. Poetry, plays were banned. Paintings, artwork. Uh, you, you, there was the censorship board. There were people who had a full-time job to be members of the censorship board. And they were there to control our work and what we had to say. And um, people got arrested. People had to leave South Africa, Miriam Akeba being one of them. And uh, anyway, when they banned this song, I'm always amazed at what were they banning because it's an instrumental song. It's a pianist and saxophone, and that's it. What did it say about apartheid, this piano and saxophone? <laughs> but they had the power, they had control, they were able to say, this song is a subversive. It shall not be played on the airwaves. But also... Um, the, the theatre, we, we performed the first time I came to the United States, I was doing a play called um, Born in the RSA with uh, um, director Barney Simon, who was my mentor over the years. I learned a lot from that man. I always um, um, say big up to, to, to him and, and the privilege of having had somebody who cared that much to groom us and take, a, to, take us to, to, to places and give us um, freedom to say we have a voice. And um, I was doing Born in the RSA, and that play happened in 1986 under the state of emergency. We performed and we were finished after 10 o'clock. 10 o'clock was a cutoff day, a time for a black person to be outdoors. You are still at the theater after 10 o'clock, and you are going to have to make it all the way to Nord Street and then take the bus, the bus that travels for an hour back to Alexander Township where I lived. Now you had to go to John Foster Square, um, the police station, and ask for an extra permit apart from your identity document. Have these two documents with you at all times. Because when you are caught by the police at whatever stop, they're going to say, what are you doing? What are you doing out of your place of residence? You are black. This is a state of emergency. What are you doing? So we had to learn all of those things and the content of our play. And when we came with that play to the United States, we performed in the Lincoln Center. We went to Amherst, we went to Washington DC, we came to Boston. We, <clears throat> we, we performed for a very diverse audience. When I discovered I was nominated for the Obi Award, I thought, what? First of all, the reviews in newspapers and, and all the recognition we got for this piece, and then to get a nomination, being just an ordinary person from my small hometown and then doing this, this theater piece, I didn't, have what it, I didn't have a sense of what an impact it was having in different countries in being able to tell the story of our people. What about that impact? Because you even just work with kids in Boston schools here, uh, how does it feel when you've got them really reeled in and attentive and listening to you? 
For me, the work that I do, I always say um, when, they, when the uh, newspapers or uh, press say, what's your audience? I say from three to 93. After 93, I don't think I can help you. So <laughs> I work with the very, very young. I work with uh, primary schools, with high schools, with universities, with the general public. I use storytelling in the corporate e places, corporate events. I go and uh, the... the, 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 the um, the EMF, when they, they, when they arrived in South Africa um, a few years ago, they had a big, big financial conference at the Durban ICC. I'm the one who did the official opening. And so you get the briefing and you write the information that is needed and the, the client takes a look at it. No, it's not strong here. No, that's not what we want to put across. And then you start telling it and uh, putting the message across in the idiom of the storyteller, storytelling from long, long ago. The same thing appeals to the young people. You want to bring them in. You want them to enjoy the, 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 the magic of the story of how you take them back in time to places they cannot even comprehend with the times we're living in, and then we bring them to the present. The joy that you have is infectious, whether the, the people are three or 93. Well, uh, we did mention you recently performed at the museum, but you have another performance coming up uh, January 20th, isn't it? Yes, yes. So some more in details. I can go to the museum website, I guess, to yeah, get that. Yeah. that right. Okay. We, 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 to, to, tomorrow I'm working with, with, with students, and then on Friday, same thing with students, but there's general public on the 20th, and I'll be definitely doing some music. One of the songs that I've been um, performing a lot is called The Bones of Memory. And um, the bones of memory is about uh, the stories that are really, really painful, the stories that are funny, the stories that are crazy, the stories that are from our very lives. But um, no matter how much you think the story is mine, I lived this life, it, the message is universal. I know for a fact that we are more alike than we are different. Thank you very much. You've seen from the Thank Garden you so Museum. much. It's an honor to be here. Thank you.